He was born in Bethlehem, they say. There was a star to light the path to where he lay. Rich or poor, they came from far and near. Because they'd all heard the reason he was here. He was the Son God sent to one and all. Put on this earth to hang there on that cross. Born to die so we could live. He had the birthday. We got the gift. They wrapped him up with gentle hands God hoped the world would understand Eternal life we shall receive And all that He asks in return Is that we just believe He was the Son God sent to one and all Put on this earth to hang there on that cross Born to die so we could live He had the birthday, we got the gift There's no way in this world we could repay The miracle He gave us on that day, he was the Son God sent to one and all. Put on this earth to hang there on that cross. Born to die so we could live. He had the birthday. We got the gift on our Savior's birthday. We got the gift. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, it's good to get to Christmas, isn't it? It's lovely to just have that time where we can press the pause button and spend time with family and friends and remind ourselves of those things in life that really count. And before we um, have a little homily, I'd invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Father God, Rob has reminded us of your extravagant generosity in giving the most valuable and precious thing you could to remind us how much you love us and what steps you will go to in order that we might be redeemed from this world of craziness and of sin. Lord, when we look around in our own lives' stories, we sometimes can only see chaos and disorder and confusion. And my plea is that your spirit would be here to remind us today that because of Jesus, things can be different, things are better, and things are good. Please be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody with a dog or a baby will know that at Christmas time, there is some confusion as to whether it's the presents or the wrapping that are the most significant. Our dog, Millie, absolutely loves presents. She will just go crazy as soon as she sees the mother wrapping things up. And whether it's her birthday or whether it's Kirsten's birthday, Jared's birthday, my birthday, Millie always gets a present. And it is family tradition, one that we treasure, that very early in the morning, whether it's Christmas or a birthday, everybody piles into the king-size bed, including Millie, and the greatest delight is watching Millie shred the wrapping paper off whatever piece of recycled vegetarian she is about to indulge in. In America, it is said that the Americans spend some $2.5 billion annually wrapping gifts. 
Now, this beautiful red Ferrari, a 458, which I would love to have, Jaden, it's slightly faster than a Golf R, is on car sales at this very moment for about $478,000. And you could buy 7,500 of these Ferraris if Americans would just give you the money they spent on wrapping gifts. That is a huge sum of money. $2.5 billion in an industry to wrap gifts. Why do we do it? Well, there are some academics around who seem to have nothing better to do than to study the habits of people. And sociologists who have looked into it would suggest that there are several reasons why we wrap presents. One is that we like something more than when it is wrapped. This is evidence-based. It has been done by very careful experiments at universities with intelligent students where they have given the same students a gift and then another set of students the same gift, only this time it was wrapped. And they found that the pleasurable experiences were significantly greater when the present comes wrapped. Why? The academics suggest that the wrapping of a gift elicits in us a happy mood. And when we are in a happy mood, we are biased to appreciate things a little more. Happy wife, happy life. We get it, don't we? We understand that. If we can create a situation where people's mood is improved, the outcomes improve. There is also the idea that wrapping paper is an independent measure of the love and care that somebody has taken in presenting you with a gift. Um, men can sometimes give a little bit recklessly, can't we? I can remember before I met Yvette, I was torn between trying to find a few dormant brain cells on the emotional side of my head. And I was, um, at that time, going out with a girl called Victoria Smith, whose father happened to be the equivalent of Harvey Norman in New Zealand. And I didn't know. Well, I did know, but I didn't care because everything was going to burn when I was about 18. But it became folklore amongst all of the people that went street preaching in King's Cross every Friday night that my feeble attempt at romance was to buy some flowers for Victoria, put them down on a bench, not even hand them to her, and say, see those weeds? They're yours. We don't do giving very well. When it comes to Christmas, when it comes to Christmas, my wife will stay up into the dim, dark hours of the morning wrapping presents. They're colour coordinated, they're thematic, they're arranged in neat piles under the tree. I'm telling the truth, aren't I, Jared? No embellishment. There is so much love that goes into the creating of the Christmas, um, I, I guess, feel. And it's awesome. You feel when you look at these presents that have been wrapped with so much love and devotion that the person who is giving this to me is giving me more than a $5.95 box of Cadbury favourites. They are making a statement that I am valuable and that I am important. And I think it's this aspect of gift, gift wrapping that has taken off, isn't it? To, to actually, did you see how well those presents were wrapped this morning? I was in the front row and I was trying to work out, Roz, who wrapped them? Sue, Sue Lin. Sue, well done. I was looking at the way the corners were mitered and I'm sure there was rulers and, and, and straight edges involved in the wrapping of those presents. Am I right? No? Ah, she's just... Talent oozes out of her and forms a puddle on the floor. It's awesome. They were, they were wrapped with love. They were bright. They looked good. It, it's fantastic. And, and Christmas wrapping does that for us. But there's a last reason and it's the kind of reason that scratches where I'm itching. There is something powerful about the suspense and anticipation involved in unwrapping a present. Would you agree? There is something that prolongs that pleasure in having to unwrap something than to have the realisation of what you've got dawn upon you in an instant. The tactile, sensory, emotive journey that we go through as we feel and caress the object, and as our imagination goes into all sorts of strange places, imagining what could be underneath that wrapping paper. That is an experience that is worth $2.5 billion a year. You would kind of wonder why you would want to wrap something like this, wouldn't you? But people do. 
Maybe they won't guess. In America, there's YouTube videos on how to wrap a cat. Oh, I hope they don't leave it under the Christmas tree for three days like some of our presents. But detailed instructions, step by step, how to wrap a cat. Indulgent parents. Beck, I can see you. Lyndon will be wrapping something like this for you not too far down the track. A couple of years. Not going to happen, Lyndon? <laughs> Matchbox. <laughs> One of the things wrapping paper tells me about life is a serious lesson. And that is when the piles of wrapping paper lie there on the floor, when, when the gifts have been opened, when the cardboard has been ripped to shreds, when the batteries are inserted, when the kids are out on the back lawn seeing how hard a plastic bat can hit a hard cricket ball over the fence. The piles of wrapping paper give testimony to the fact that for every gasp of excitement there is often also a similar number of cries of disappointment. When the anticipation of something great proves to be the reality of something ordinary. I'll never forget when we were delivering Crisco hampers. Is there anyone here old enough to remember when Blue Hills College raised money developing Crisco hampers? They were fun days, weren't they, Paul and Jill? up to all hours of the night, walking around, finding bottles of bourbon to put in boxes to take to people and wondering how this would be looked upon by all of those of us who believe strongly in the health message. Um, I dropped a bottle, Jill, just to crack it. Felt quite righteous. <laughs> but we were way out there in a suburb called Benalbo. Is anyone here who's been to Benalbo? And Benalbo has quite a lot of houses in it, but there's a street that's just full of um, housing commission houses. And it's kind of like an interesting study in sociology to deliver for Crisco. The houses that you deliver to don't look like anything like the ads that they show on TV. They're not big palatial mansions with manicured lawns and people sitting around fireplaces roasting chestnuts and looking happy. You often are taking Crisco to the most chaotic houses in the social landscape. And we were out there in Benalbo and I, was, I was, um, had a trolley. This person, had a, it, it, it must have been two to $3,000 worth of Crisco they'd order, ordered and we needed to stack them on trolleys. And as I'm wheeling it through the long grass, I hear this sickening crack. And I look down and I realise that as I'm delivering this year's Christmas presents, I've just run over and destroyed last year's Christmas present lying neglected on the front lawn. And it was a real aha moment for me. I, I was feeling, I just was feeling really unsettled about what we were doing with Crisco. I'd, I'm not here to make comment or, or moral judgment. I've got many friends in the Aboriginal community who love the idea of Crisco and they get so excited. One of my friends only last week is telling me that she's been saving all, all year and she's going on a cruise that she's paid for with Crisco. And for some people, it's a really good way for them to save. But you also recognise as you're handing over a box of CCs that somebody spent an extraordinary amount of money having this home delivered when they could have got it for half of the price at a special at Woolworths if they had have had liquid cash. But as I was wheeling this trolley over and I hear this sickening crack, I, I can see that there is a collision of two realities there is the anticipation that in these boxes lies happiness and joy and an escape from the mundane, dreary existence that is the reality of the people living behind these doors. And at the same time, I can see lying on the path, broken dreams, shattered hopes, and the futility that it doesn't matter how we wrap life Sometimes what's on the inside isn't what we thought would be there. Could it be that we spend so much time wrapping our presents because dogs and babies are actually right? 
that there is more joy in the paper than there is in the present, that in anticipation of what could be, of the warm feelings of being loved and the fact that real joy lies not in the material, not in cars that will depreciate, clothes that will fade or technology that will become redundant, but that real joy lies in knowing that we are loved, that we are valuable and that we are cared for. You know, God is love. And God lo- God's love led him to give. The text that we all know so well tells us that because God loves, God gives. And God gives extravagantly, and God gives expensively, and God gives inconveniently. God's love is something that you can't put in a box. It cannot be wrapped. It's transcendent. It's eternal. It is not something that can be confined to time and space. And when our giving echoes God's giving, that is when we fully understand the nature of living and of love. When we wrap a present for our children, we want them to be aware that the gift is but a token of our love for them. We want them to linger in the pleasure of anticipation, to be able to cherish the fantasy that the gift they hold in their hands is more than the material. God is so much more willing to give us gifts unwrapped, gifts that exceed our fondest hopes And our wildest dreams. When God gave Jesus, he was making a statement as to how much he values us. And like any parent, he was wanting to say, if I will not spare my own son, then you can know that with the gift of Jesus, I will graciously give you all things. We want our children to know when we give them gifts that their connection to us ensures that we will be their champion, that we will be their protectors, that we will be their mentors, their friends, their examples, their guides, their point of reference and their resource in time of need. And if we as children so often caught up in the chaos of human limitation, know how to make that statement to our own children, how much more will a God of perfection, a God of holiness, and a God of unlimited resources give to us all that we need to know that we are championed, that we are rescued, that we are redeemed and mentored and discipled. The Holy Spirit is given to us the greatest of all gifts to let us know that we are connected with somebody who loves us, who cares about us, and wants what is best for us. You know, I was torn this morning as I was looking at YouTube because I found a rendition of Santa Claus's Coming to Town by Michael Bublé that I really wanted to play. Forgive me for those of you who like Michael Bublé that I didn't play it. And for all those of you who hate him, breathe a sigh of relief. But Michael Bublé does this magnificent version of Santa Claus's Coming to Town. And as you're bopping along to the music, I can't remember all the words, but essentially paraphrased, there's a few signs in there that tell me that Santa Claus is nothing like Jesus. Santa knows if you've been naughty or nice. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows that when you're awake. He knows whether you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Is that right? It frightens me when we santify God. God is nothing like Santa. God does not look down over human experience and decide to intervene and bless those who have been good. God looks down from a spirit of generosity. He sends his reign on the just and the unjust. He gives the gift of eternal life to whoever will. It is not because we deserve it, but because he is kind that grace is dispensed freely. And if there are any of you who look in the mirror and see your own personal story yelling back at you with tones of failure and compromise and the realities of a world that could have, should have, but isn't, Let me remind you that it is through grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not because of who we are, but because of who he is. 
that we have access to salvation. The gift of God is amazing. The only thing that we have a right to earn is the right of consequences of rebellion. But eternal life and the blessings of heaven are a gift. It is who God is. He just wants to put his treasures into human vessels. He looks down at you and he looks down at me and he says it's not because of who they are but because of who I am and who they can become that I will give them the opportunity to be on my team and on my side. You know, we've all had those Christmases when we wonder how much thought those claiming to love us have put into their gifts. I can remember when my own mum and dad were very poor and they knew that I was interested in learning the piano. So my dad went down to the music store and without consulting my mother, which was fairly common in our house, bought a thing called a melodica. Does anyone know what a melodica is? It's kind of like a, I don't know, put a recorder and a piano accordion in a blender and turn it on high for a few minutes and as long as Dawkins is in the room, a melodica will pop out. It's, it's about that long and you blow it, but it's got piano keys on it. And I can remember just feeling absolutely devastated that my parents would insult me by buying me a melodica. I was too ashamed to admit at school that I got a melodica. And though my dad sat there with my mum whipping him, trying to blow and constant things so I could practice my piano on the melodica, it didn't cut the mustard and it wasn't too many days later that a piano turned up in our house. But imagine the trauma of being given this. I don't know how good your eyes are, but this is an extreme video game that imitates household chores. It's got a rake in it, a dishpan, a spade and a letterbox. And I think the aim of the game is that instead of doing real chores, you stand in front of the TV and try and rake the leaves before the wind blows them all away. Man, a fellow would be depressed if his mum gave him that. And what about this? Nice brush for an even nicer head of hair. And who hasn't got the jumper from grandma that's six sizes too big? I'm sure there are many of us when it comes to Christmas that when the wrapping paper is all torn off, we'll learn that the joy is in anticipation because reality will often leave us disenchanted. Those with the weakest arguments often shout the loudest and those with the poorest products usually pay the most for advertising. Plain packaging has impacted the tobacco industry in our country and other countries where governments are seeking to impose the idea that tobacco needs to come without any imagery or any branding are nervous because they have seen what happens. Tobacco sales will fall. We live in a society that spends millions, in fact billions, creating anticipatory pleasure to create the mood and the vibe and the feel that everything is going to be all right. But as we bring this to a close, let us remember this Christmas that our God is not in the business of over-promising and under-delivering. Anticipate and dream as much as you can. No one can truly grasp the gifts of God. Wrapping paper can add nothing to the reality of his gifts. In, in raw form, in its honest form, without adjectival embellishment, a new heart, a new beginning, a new hope, these are heaven's gifts that all who listen today have free access to. Jesus came wrapped in the plainness of swaddling clothes. God was making a statement. It was unnecessary that heaven should choose special packaging. The greatest gift that God has given us cannot be boxed. 
And yet it is a wonder today that there are so few who really appreciate what God has given us in Jesus. We live in a world that is obsessed with the material. We measure our value and the value we place on others by things that can be wrapped. My challenge this Christmas to my church is that we follow the lead of Jesus and begin to place more emphasis on the transcendent. To give love, to be liberal, to be generous, to heal, to forgive, to be true, to be honest, to be trustworthy, to be reliable. We can only love as we have loved. We can only spread joy as we are joyful. We can only forgive as we are forgiven. Church, let us live in the world of the unwrapped. As little children, we would dream of Christmas more, of all the gifts and toys we knew we'd find, but we never realized a baby born one blessed night gave us the greatest gift of our lives. We are the reason that he gave his life. We are the reason that he suffered and died. To a world that was lost, he gave all he could give. To show us the reason to leave. As the years went by, we learned more about gifts, the giving of ourselves, and what that means. On a dark and cloudy day, a man come flying in the rain because of love, because of love. We the reason that he gave his life. We are the reason that he suffered and died. To a world that was lost, he gave all he could give to show us the reason to leave. I finally found the reason for living. It's in giving every part of my heart to Him. In all that I do, every word that I say, I'll be giving my all just for Him. For Him, we are the reason that He gave His love.
mercy and your kindness towards us. Lord, as we contemplate the gift of Jesus, may a miracle of grace occur in our heart. Confident in your love towards us, grant us freedom to love others like you have loved us, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.